Bonjour tout le monde et merci de nous rejoindre ce soir. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for our public presentation on natural hazard mapping for Black Creek and the South Branch of the South Nation River within the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas and Glengarry. My name is John Messman and I'm South Nation Conservation Authority's Managing Director of Property, Conservation Land and Community Outreach and I have the pleasure of being your moderator for the evening. For those listening in right now, we're about to get started. And uh, while we wait for a few more people to tune in, I'll share some meeting procedures. We do expect this meeting to be about 30 to 40 minutes, and we'll stay online to answer any questions that you might have for us. We will also be delivering this presentation in English. However, our slides will also display in French on your screen. And all of this content is available in French on our website at nation.on.ca slash consultations. Donc, nous ferons cette présentation en anglais. Cependant, nos diapos s'afficheront également en français et tout ce contenu disponible en français sur notre site web à nation.on.ca slash consultation. For those familiar with our usual consultation process, we really do enjoy the ability to meet people in person in their communities, usually in the closest arena or school, and to really sit down one on one and show you the maps for your property and talk about your experiences with flooding or where you might have noticed erosion on your property. However, due to our project timelines, along with, you know, the often unpredictable winter season, and because we are completing three separate consultations for three different areas within our region at the same time, we are making these public presentations available online and are also providing an extended consultation timeline so that property owners may schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with our staff after the presentation. And these can take place either in person or online so that you can uh, review property specific mapping throughout the month of March, 2024. These meetings are also being recorded and will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. For those online with us right now, please note that your videos and microphones are automatically turned off, so you don't have to worry about any potential feedback or IT issues, and you're comfortable uh, to watch this presentation wherever is most convenient for you. You may also ask questions at any point through the Q&A tab on your screen, uh, which you can use to type in your questions for us. And please do feel free to type them in as we go along, as there is about a 30 second lag between the time when we're speaking out loud and the live broadcast that you're watching. So we might not actually see your question when we're discussing a particular topic, but our team is able to respond to them throughout the meeting. And of course, we'll have time at the end to explore any additional questions or, or examples that might be of interest to folks. Uh, for this meeting, we'll be providing you with some information on our organization. Uh, but also on natural hazards, and we'll share some information on how the study was completed, how to access the maps, and what this means if you're looking to develop or build. And as mentioned earlier, all of this information, including the draft maps, the bilingual presentation, and other resources and tools are available at nation.on.ca slash consultations. And with that, just looking at the time, we've got a few more people logged in, which is really great to see. So I, I think we'll get started. So again, welcome everyone, bienvenue à tous to our public meeting for updated natural hazard mapping of Black Creek and the south branch of the South Nation River within the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry. Everyone who owns property within or adjacent to this area in our draft maps would have received a letter from us a few weeks ago with an invitation to attend this meeting. And if you didn't receive a letter and are on this call, it's okay, don't, don't worry. You're still welcome to watch, participate, or, or ask any questions. So um, I'll kick things off uh, with maybe, maybe a few questions or a few comments rather about our organization, the South Nation Conservation Authority, just to give you a bit of an overview on who we are and what we do. And once I'm done, I'll pass the hot seat over to some of my colleagues to explain a bit about why and how we map natural hazards. And we'll walk through a few permitting examples for you. So we are one of Ontario's 36 Conservation Authority, which operates under provincial legislation called the Conservation Authorities Act. But we also deliver other work through agreements with provincial ministries and our own municipalities to deliver local environmental services. In our region of Eastern Ontario, we work for 16 different municipalities and our jurisdiction is around the South Nation River and its tributaries, beginning near the head headwaters near Brockville and ending near Plantagenet, where the river empties into the Ottawa River. 
You'll also notice in the map that our jurisdiction extends to both the St. Lawrence and Ottawa rivers. These are recent developments over the last decade where we've extended our jurisdiction to these rivers at the request of our municipalities to help deliver environmental services, especially uh, floodplain mapping and flood forecasting. Which means though we work as watershed managers to manage, conserve and restore natural resources, you can expect that one of the most important parts of our jobs is to protect people and property from natural hazards like flooding, erosion and landslides. We also deliver several services on behalf of our partners, including septic system inspections and drinking water source protection. We're also operating eight different dams and other water control structures and managing water response programs to help predict and respond to flood events. The landslide photo on your screen is not included in the study area, but is the largest recorded landslide in Ontario between Castleman and Lemieux. This area has been susceptible to large scale landslides for centuries and has experienced significant events in the 70s and 90s. This hazard area was mapped by us and is regulated to limit development. In the 90s, we were also successful in relocating the former village of Lemieux and its residents just one year before the landslide in that photo occurred 500 meters from the village main street. This potential hazard area is not included in the study, but it is a good reminder of why we do this work, much like the Ottawa River floods of 2017 and 2019. The study area we'll be reviewing today includes clay soils and a fairly flat landscape that is primarily in agricultural and rural residential uses. Like the landslide areas, our, our staff work to also map floodplains and erosion hazard and other areas identified by our municipalities to ensure that whatever new buildings are approved are being built in the safest places possible. So when our staff review development files and proposals, and you, we'll share some examples in a bit, we're not always looking to restrict development like we would in the Castleman to Lemieux area. Our staff are working with the property owner, developer, and municipality to find ways to approve projects when it's safe. And though we want to provide support for good construction projects, we, we do have to be clear in saying that this can be very circumstantial. There's not always a one size fits all approach to approvals. And this is why permission is required through a permit before work can proceed. There may be instances where what is proposed to be built may not be safe, whether due to safe access, steep slopes or flood elevations, for example. However, there are many scenarios where proposals can be altered, moved or flood proofed so that when you're so that you're able to receive a building permit for your work. We want to make sure that we're able to approve development that's going to protect you, but also your investment being your property and the buildings you construct on them. We also need to consider how the alteration of water courses or your shoreline or even your construction project might impact your neighbors and their properties. We also deliver environmental monitoring programs that help us report on watershed conditions and environmental health. I mentioned this because our planning and regulations team also use this data to make informed decisions when reviewing development proposals. And when we know an area is in poor environmental health, we also do our best to work with our partners to help improve the environment through restoration projects. On this, I, I do want to share a reminder, though, that, you know, we're very proud of the restoration work that we do every year, but we are a non for profit and we do rely on fundraising and project partnerships to help fund this type of work. And so it's through these funding partnerships with government, academia and industry where we're able to work together to improve the local environment. And of course, community stewardship and outreach is an important part of this work. We also deliver a number of different environmental stewardship programs through agreements with our counties and municipalities, and it, they include things like roadside tree planting programs, free woodlot advisory services, uh, storm recovery programs like depicted in the image, and also water quality improvement programs for farmers that offer cost share funding for projects that help improve water quality. And so some of these programs are specifically funded by our municipal partners and delivered in their area. However, many of our services are accessible throughout our jurisdiction, with our most popular initiative being our tree planting programs, which is often what people know us most for. And we do have a variety of subsidies available to help complete projects on private property. And we were very pleased to plant our 4 millionth tree since 1990 last year. 
Which brings us to a final slide for our overview. We did want to mention that we are a public land trust and work to protect significant natural spaces in Eastern Ontario. And we've been acquiring land since 1970 through partial purchase and donation. And so many of these properties were also acquired for flood mitigation, including areas to construct berms and dikes, and some areas were acquired to keep them from being developed. But much of our land is forested or contains provincially significant wetlands. We do own over 13,000 acres of conservation land and operate about 15 different day use parks called conservation areas. And I also wanted to mention that most of our parks were actually on land that was donated to us by people to help protect and conserve their family's natural legacy. And there's more information on our website about these programs. And with that, um, I'll move us into the public presentation on natural hazard updates. So when we talk about natural hazard mapping, we are generally talking about maps that identify floodplains and erosion hazards in a particular drainage area. Floodplains are low-lying areas near water courses that can be susceptible to flooding, especially during the spring melt or during heavy rain events. And erosion hazards are areas that may potentially be subject to slope failure or a retreat, um, which can often be triggered by a variety of geological, hydrologic, or man-made factors. The example on the screen shows a house within a regulated area where development would be limited due to the steep ravine behind the house, which has an unstable slope. Unfortunately, in this scenario, a garage was constructed without a permit in 2016, which resulted in the garage and the back end of the property falling into the ravine in the following year, which was likely due to that additional loading that was put on the top of the slope. Our organization identifies potential flood risk areas for local municipalities, and we complete natural hazard mapping when requested by our municipal partners. And so this type of work is also funded by all levels of government that work together to identify flood hazards to ensure that we're able to protect people and property and support sustainable new development. The guidelines and methodologies used to complete this work are established by the province of Ontario uh, to ensure consistency in hazard mapping and permitting across the province. Often these studies are requested when a particular area is experiencing increased development pressure. And so this provides developers the information they need to safely design new communities. We also do get requests to study areas that don't have mapping or to update older hazard maps that were completed in the 1980s. The older studies didn't have access to the high resolution topographical data or the types of commuter models that we use today. And so once the mapping is updated and included within the Conservation Authority regulations, the hazard maps are also included in official plans and municipal zoning schedules. And this important step ensures that property owners know about the hazard areas on a property whenever they're either building, buying, or selling land. And so if you received a letter in the mail about the mapping updates, your property may be located within a regulated area for natural hazards. This means that you may need permission through a permit to construct new buildings or to further develop your property in the regulated area. There is no impact to current land uses like agriculture. You can continue to farm productive land, but you may need a permit to construct buildings to place or remove large amounts of fill, or if you're looking to subdivide your land uh, for future housing. And so the permit from the Conservation Authority is going to provide you with the steps to safely undertake your project. It will ensure that people and property are protected from potential impacts of natural hazards, and it will ensure, it'll ensure that sustainable development practices are in place before a building permit from your municipality can be issued. Natural hazards are mapped using a combination of on-the-ground field work and computer modeling. Background data is gathered on land use, topography, stream flow, and precipitation. Field surveys collect information on local infrastructure, so things like culverts and bridges. And for each mapping project, field work is completed on public and private properties with permission from property owners at the beginning of the project. The field data that we collect 
is also complemented with LIDAR mapping, which stands for light detection ranging. And this LIDAR provides us that detailed topographical information that we use in our models. And we did recently coordinate the creation of new LIDAR mapping for most of Eastern Ontario over the last few years through a partnership with all levels of government. And so through this initiative, we um, contracted airplanes to fly over the region and use remote sensing techniques with pulse lasers to help create 3D elevation models of the landscape. This topographical information is then used with our field data, historical information, and our climate stations. And a computer model is used to calculate stream flow for different precipitation events. And we do also create extra mapping products of different storm scenarios for our emergency responders. The models are then reviewed by expert uh, engineering consultants outside of our organization before the draft baths are finalized and made available on our website. And now I'm going to pass things over to one of our water resource engineers, Shaheen Zan, to explain how these hazards are mapped. Yes, thank you, John, and hello, everyone. With the use of uh, computer models, we are able to define flood and erosion hazards based on provincial standards, which means that when we're looking at floodplains, we are modeling and mapping a storm event that could create what's called a major 100-year flood known as the 100-year flood event standard. This rain and flood event would have a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. For erosion hazards, which is a more permissive regulation, they are mapped based on the 100-year erosion rate standard, which means we are looking at the average annual rate of erosion or recession in a given area over a 100-year time span. After floodplains are mapped and the flow of water is well defined in different storm scenarios, the regulated area along a river or a stream is generally determined by adding a 15 meter buffer or allowance around the 100 year flood event. A permission is required for development within the entire area where we look at safe access and flood water levels among other con considerations. Erosion hazards are areas potentially subject to land regression due to a combination of factors. One thing to note for this study area is that the previous mapping only included an analysis of floodplains and not erosion hazards. With erosion hazards, we are investigating the average rate of recession over a 100 year time span. Riverine erosion hazard has three main components. Analysis of slope stability, tow erosion, and access allowance. However, erosion hazard mapping will not always have an additional allowance added to the regulation area, as these areas are mapped more conservatively with access considerations included. When creating the regulation area, which you will see in, our, in online mapping on our geoportal, you may not always see the different hazards identified. This is because we use the greatest of either hazard to create the regulation area. In many cases, especially within a flood landscape like this, in this area, we are mostly identifying flood hazards. However, there are several areas where the erosion hazard is slightly greater than the flood plane. The Conservation Authority may grant permission for proposed work in a natural hazard area if it is demonstrated to SNC's satisfaction that the proposed work will not affect the control of flooding or erosion. Now I'll turn things back over to John. Thanks, Shaheen. Uh, so the map on the screen uh, is now showing the regulations area for the south branch of the South Nation River and Black Creek, which is mostly included within North and South Dundas. This area includes a 319 square kilometer drainage area and about a 9.5 meter elevation drop uh, over those 20 kilometers of water courses, which means the elevation is changing by about half a meter every kilometer. And so this flat landscape, as Shaheen alluded to, accounts for some of the larger floodplain spill areas that you might see on some of the maps online. And 
One thing to note about the study area, um, as Shaheen alluded to, is that the South Branch of the South Nation River is already regulated by the Conservation Authority. The last floodplain study was completed for this area back in 1995, and the new study that we recently completed did help refine the area, mostly due to the higher accuracy of the technology we have access to today. And it, it did actually result in some minor decreases in floodplain area in some parts of the maps. However, uh, erosion hazards were not identified back in 1995, so you also noted uh, this identified for some of the areas as well. Additionally, one area uh, to point out um, that you won't find old maps to compare to is Black Creek. And so that's the second water course at the bottom or southern portion of this map. This area was studied for the first time by South Nation. And now I'm going to pass things over to Ben Colgan, our GIS and database analyst, who will show you how to interpret the maps and use our online portal. Thanks, John, and, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so to help make it easier for everyone to view the mapping products, uh, we've developed an easy to use web mapping application that's linked up on our consultation webpage. This tool will help you understand what potential impacts the proposed regulation data has on your own property and home. To help ensure that everyone can use the web tool, I'm gonna to walk through a short demonstration. So first, you'll need to access SNC's website at nation.on.ca slash consultations, or you can navigate from the homepage. You can click the heading titled Development and select Public Consultation Natural Hazards Mapping, and then click on that link. Once on the public consultation page, scroll down to the information about South Branch Study, as there are separate maps and web links for each of the study areas we're sharing with the public this month. Once you've found the South Branch of the South Nation River section, you'll see the map with the regulations area depicted in gold, as shown by John previously. Directly under this image, select the link that says click here to access the interactive property map. Now we've arrived at the web mapping application and you'll need to accept the terms of use, which describes the mapping area included and reminds users that this information is only to be used as a reference tool for personal and non-commercial use. It also reminds users that people should contact our office directly to confirm information or if they wish to obtain um, a printed map of their property. Once accepted, you can now see the draft data displayed. The blue fill area is the draft floodplain and the yellow line indicates the extent of the regulation area. Once here, feel free to zoom in and out of the map and pan in different directions, just like you would if you were using Google Maps. Just note that this viewer is only going to display information for this particular study area, which is South Branch. We can also search for a specific address using the search bar that's found in the upper left-hand corner. Here you can enter your home address to review the floodplain and regulation data in relation to your property. So let's try that with a specific location within the South Branch study area. In this example, I searched for the intersection of Bonjers Road and Snowbird Road. I was able to select that location from the drop-down menu that appears after we search for an address. When we select the address from the drop-down menu, the map will automatically zoom to that location and place an orange pin on the address that you can see on the screen. Now we can start to review the data in detail. We can use the legend button to tell us what data we're currently viewing. In the legend on the top right of the screen, we can see that the draft regulation data is shown as the yellow line and the floodplain is shown as a blue fill. If we use the map layers button, which is left of the map legend, we can change what layers are actually displayed on the map. For example, we can turn off the draft floodplain layer, which is the new floodplain we've updated, and turn on the current approved regulation line, which is our old regulation line that was developed in 1995. And now we can see a dash purple line. With these layers on, we can compare both the current and draft regulation line and see how the draft line has changed during this update. We can also use the map layers menu to compare the current and draft flood lines. On the screen now, we can see that the draft floodplain is shown in dark blue, while the current or previous floodplain is shown as a brighter blue line. The best way to start fresh and look up a new address is to refresh your web browser and reload the map and just enter a brand new address. PDF maps are also available in detail on the website, which can be downloaded, but the online map will certainly help you access the data a lot quicker, so definitely give it a shot. Once a consultation and review is completed, the final version of the regulation data will be added to SNC's main geo portal, which can be found on SNC's main homepage.
And with that, I'll pass things over to Claire LeMay, one of our senior planners at South Nation Conservation. Thank you, Ben. I work as part of the team that reviews applications for development, and I'm going to share a few examples with you to explain the process for getting a Conservation Authorities Act permit in the regulated area. Our definition of development includes new buildings, additions to existing buildings, site grading, and adding or removing fill. If you're planning any work like this in or near the regulated area, or if you're looking to buy property within the regulated area, the first step is to call or email the South Nation office. Our staff will let you know if you need a permit. I'm going to share two examples with you of what the permit application process is like for landowners wanting to do work in or near the regulated areas. On this slide, we have an example of a property that has floodplain and erosion hazards. The floodplain is shown in blue and the regulated area is shown in yellow. In this example, the owner wanted to build a garage. The first step was to call South Nation to consult on the required setback from the slope and river. After the first phone call, he provided a basic sketch of the proposed garage size and location. Because the garage was proposed close to the edge of the slope, South Nation's permitting officer noted that an engineer would need to complete a study and determine what the safe setback distance is from the hazard. South Nation also asked for architectural plans for the garage a sediment and erosion control plan, and a description of the work. The next step in the process is to prepare the supporting information. This might be something you can do yourself, but can often require hiring an expert. The landowner in this example hired a local engineering firm to prepare a sediment and erosion control plan and a slope stability study. The engineering firm also measured elevations on the property and confirmed that the proposed garage was outside of the flood hazard. The landowner drew the building plans himself, which he also used for his building permit application. Once a complete application is received by South Nation, staff will notify you of the appropriate fees based on our fee schedule, which is publicly available on our website. The complexity of the file and size of the development helps to determine the level of review needed and the corresponding fee. For more complex applications like this one, they're reviewed by SNC's technical review team. The review team may have questions for the experts who prepared the plans and studies. And in this case, we were able to resolve our questions via email with the engineer. Now, one thing to note is that not all permit applications will require additional technical review. Once the review is complete, you'll receive the permit by email. It may include conditions like a follow up visit after the work is completed. Most permits are issued with a two year timeline to complete the work. It's possible to ask for an extension if you don't end up completing your project within that time. The landowner in our example was able to build his new garage safely outside of the floodplain and with an appropriate setback from the slope. He knows that his investment is safe because of our review. In our second example, the landowner wanted to build an extension to the existing house. So she contacted SNC by email to ask if she would need a permit. Because the regulation line overlaps with the location of the existing house, we needed to know the exact location of the proposed work. South Nation provided a digital map to the landowner's architect so they could check if the proposed addition was inside the SNC regulated area. The architect recommended adjusting the building layout so that the addition would be entirely outside the regulated area. This meant there was no requirement for a permit from South Nation and the addition was located well away from the hazard area. 
I'll pass things back over to John now, who will share some contact information and important links before closing the meeting. All right, well, as we're nearing the end of our presentation, I did want to remind our viewers that they are still able to use the question function if they're interested in sharing any questions with us, and uh, we'd be happy to respond to those. And thanks to our team members who have been supporting some of those questions during the meeting. This study was completed at the request of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, and is funded by the counties, the Conservation Authority, and has received support from the Government of Canada through the Flood Hazard Identification and Mapping Program. Please feel free to connect with our team directly. However, you're also welcome to contact our county partners, including Peter Young, the Director of Planning and Economic Development Services, or Stephanie Morin, SGG's Community Planner. We also welcome one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, which are being scheduled right now between March 1st and March 22nd, which can be organized virtually by telephone or in person at our administrative office in Finch. There is a request form online where you can select your preferred meeting time, whether it be mornings, afternoons, or evenings, and we'll suggest times that will work best for you. And as part of that request, if you're able to include a little bit of information, uh, we'll be able to make sure that the right team members are available to meet with you, including our engineers, planners, or, or regulations officer. And of course, we're happy to organize our meetings in either English or French. Now I'm just checking the question box and um, I don't see any new questions submitted. I don't know if everyone was hoping to let us off easy tonight, um, but we will stick around for a couple minutes in case anyone has some questions they're hoping uh, to share with us. But like I said, the best way, especially if you have questions uh, specific to your property or if you already have a plan in place or an idea of what you're hoping to do with your property, we're of, of course happy to to dive into those one-on-one -on -one with you uh, at your convenience throughout the month of March. 